So as I was saying, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our last uh, webinar from our Getting Personalizing Right webinar series. Our essential personalized learning team at the Center for Collaborative Education, we believe that personalized learning is the key to academic success and educational equity. As an NGLC regional partner, we are partnering with schools and districts all over Mass to envision models of personalized learning based on the context of their schools. So now I would like to introduce um, your speakers today, which is myself. Right? So my name is Carla Vigil, and I am a senior associate of the district and school design team at CCE. I'm also the co-founder of an initiative called Edu Leaders of Color Rhode Island that works to empower and elevate the voices of teachers and leaders of color. Prior to my work at CCE, I served as an education strategy specialist with Highlander Institute, where I supported the implementation of culturally responsive teaching with blended and personalized learning initiatives in classrooms across Rhode Island. I was also an elementary school teacher, fourth grade, um, that was dedicated to broadening in students' perspective through multicultural and social justice education. I'm currently a big picture learning, deeper learning equity fellow, and I'm deeply committed to promoting equity in education. Much of my work includes leading workshops on culturally responsive teaching and diversity and equity in education. My Fabulous guest today is Diana Laboe, Lebeau, which I hope I didn't mess up her last name. She is the Director of District and School Design, and she currently leads the EPL team and supports school with the design process in order to grow a robust and successful essential personalized learning network. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. So before I get started, um, I wanted to let you know a little bit about myself, but really more importantly, I want to I want to let you know and tell you why I do this work and why I'm so invested in education, but more specifically in equity. So I was born in El Salvador um, and immigrated to this country in 1983. My parents came here to escape the Civil War. They came here with hopes and with dreams, which um, they're very similar reasons to many other families that emigrate to this country. And they had um, the dreams of building a successful life. Education was really important in my family. And so my, my parents recognized the value of, of going to school, of getting an education in order to achieve. However, it wasn't until um, I was completing my master's when I had a chance to really reflect on my educational journey, and I realized how the lack of access to resources and opportunities really Im impacted my personal growth as well as my academic growth. Now, I'm a mother of three boys, an 18-year-old who's about to graduate, a 12-year-old, and a soon-to-be one-year-old this Saturday. And um, I work now really hard to provide for them and to give them the opportunities that, that were not um, possible for me. I feel the same way for all learners. My belief is that all learners deserve the access and the opportunities in order to experience a good education so that they could reach their potential and social, and social success. So that's my why. And I think, um, like I said, I think it's important to understand um, where I'm coming from as your presenter today. And I think it's essential to start this collective equity work by speaking to people's hearts and values. People's values and hearts, shall I say. So now if you could um, quickly, if you could share with us what your why is. Why are you doing this work? Why are you in education? Um, and I'm going to give you maybe like a minute or so to share some thoughts on what your why is. If 
few seconds. All right, I see some responses. Some people are saying that their why is because they're invested in students. Some people are saying their why is because they're dedicated to the youth in their community. Somebody said their why is to inspire those students who are hard to reach, as I was in school. And somebody said that their why is because they want to provide um, a good education for all students. Also, let me see just one more. My why is for every child, it's frustrating to only be meeting the needs of the majority and not every student. So yes, yes, and yes. I couldn't agree with you more, and your responses also resonate um, with me as well. So I think that, again, just to add to why we just did that <laughs> is because when you know your why, your what has more of an impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Um, this was a statement that was um, said by Michael Jr who actually also has a very good video. So if you Google him, you'll see a video that he did, which is really um, impactful um, as to why, why you should state the reason you're doing your work. So we're gonna start by going over our um, five principles that we believe here at Center for Collaborative Education. So through this series, series, we have focused on these five principles of personalized learning. We've covered competency-based learning, student-driven learning, dispositions of learning, and authentic learning. And today, we'll focus on what flexible learning is and what it looks like in the classroom. It's important to note that each principle works hand-in-hand -hand with each other to provide an educational, ed, sorry, an educational experience for every student by embracing their individual strengths, their needs, their passions, their interests, and culture. During the next hour or so, we hope that we will steer your thinking towards a sustainable, equitable, school-wide change. Additionally, I hope that today's session helps you gain valuable insight into your school district and that it gives you information to support you in designing personalized learning programming that ensures equitable educational opportunities for all students. As we take this journey together, I want to remind folks that, that the meaning of um, flexible learning and its relation to personalized learning must happen with equity at the center of the work. I want us all to take a look at this image. Some of you might have seen this image. Some may have not. I think the most common um, display of this image is with the first two, two boxes of equality versus equity. And I want you to, like, to think about it a little bit, um, what feelings it brings up, how you interpret it. And I also want to start off by really defining what equity means. The National Equity Project defines equity by stating that it means that every child receives what they need to develop their full and academic, their full academic and social potential. So how does that reflect this image shown? The first, the first box of equality, you'll notice that they all, they're all standing on one equal box, right? And you'll notice that the third um, figure of person is, this has no, can, can, cannot look over the fence or the barrier, right? And so the second box of equity, you'll notice that they're giving the tools um, in order to look over the, the, the fence or, so to speak, to reach the same goal. What I really enjoy about this image is that it goes a little bit further to push towards equity by eliminating that fence, which to me represents the barriers that exist in our system, those challenges, and really making it accessible for all the three figures to look to reach their potential and to reach success. And I, I, I wanted you to all really think about this image and, and um, think about and reflect on it as we move through um, this work in the next hour or so. I think it's important to think of it 
in the way that we operate. So from what lens are we teaching? From what lens are we operating from? Um, and how does that impact our flexible learning environments? How does that impact our decisions that lead to that type of environment? So the next image is interesting. And I picked it um, very intentionally to really spark thought. Um, I want you to just, again, analyze it, think about what, um, what comes, up to your, comes up in your mind as, as you look at this. Um, I'm gonna show you another image right now. What are your first thoughts? What do you notice immediately? How does it make you feel? So these images shown represent many class, how many classrooms have been um, in the past. The straight rows of desks, students sitting up straight with their hands folded, teacher usually at the head of the class. Um, a very traditional way of learning or the space, a very traditional way of, of, of the space in the classroom. Today, we're gonna to explore what a 21st century classroom should reflect in order to meet the needs of our diverse learners. So before we start, let's go over some essential questions of this session. We'll go over what flexible learning is, what are the conditions that are necessary in order to have a successful um, flexible learning environment, what does flexible learning look like in the classroom? And how can flexible learning support equitable teaching practices? So let's define the meaning of flexible learning. Flexible learning principle is defined when the time, space, and teacher roles adapt to the needs of students through the use of technology and flexible structures, rather than being fixed one size fits all experience. I think it's important to note here that when we talk about teachers' roles adapting to students' needs and to who they are, um, we must start with understanding who we are in order to understand who our students are and to make those um, modifications and adjustments. Learning can happen in flexible learning. Learning can happen inside or outside the school and classroom walls with extended projects often requiring longer blocks of uninterrupted time. Thus, schedules accommodate flexible learning. Curricula may include service learning, internships, field research on actual community challenges, using online learning, and oral history projects. There was a recent study in the US that Found that found in the research that flexible learning environments were shown to increase engagement, which then improved grades and enhanced student participation. The students also seemed happier and were having more engaging conversations, which I would say makes sense because when students are able to um, engage in your curriculum and engage in your classroom, they're happier. And so I think that that leads to uh, better performance. By giving students a choice of learning spaces, you empower them to take responsibility of their own learning. The teacher plays a more passive role as a facilitator or administrator and is an instrumental part in encouraging students to learn themselves. However, um, I think there's been some resistance and apprehension in, in really creating um, a flexible learning environment. And I think the root of that has been not knowing where to start or where to begin. So if you feel this way and you're unsure of how to like move forward, you're definitely not alone. Um, a flexible learning environment has to be worked on throughout the whole school with um, uh, leadership at the forefront, and it happens in, in phases and slowly. Now I want you to look at some images of what flexible learning can look like. 
And I don't want you to think about the challenges like money or expenses or, or just the overall infrastructure of your school. Just kind of want you to look at the space and, and again, think about um, what comes up, what thoughts come up for you, um, how this could potentially be your classroom in your school or in your district. I also would like to share um, a resource that is um, an online resource called Room to Learn. This resource can support you in really creating a um, flexible learning environment. So I just want to check, oh, so if you look at your um, box on the right hand side, you'll notice that the link is attached there. So remember that Changing your school environment from that traditional kind of like 1980 style is kind of like what my classrooms look, look, looked like when I was going to school um, and design and, and making it to a flexible, um, agile design. It really doesn't need to be expensive and it doesn't have to be um, a, a challenging process. It could be rolled out um, throughout the school in a more gradual process. All right. So when we think about flexible learning, we're really creating environments that allow students to learn at various times and places within and beyond a traditional school day or building through a blended of instructional methods designed to increase opportunity and access, equitably meeting individuals' academic needs. This includes anytime, anywhere learning. So what does that mean, right? So that means that each student's flexible and self-directed schedule may be different based on their interests, their learning styles, and pace. The schedule changes as the students progress in attaining competencies. This also means flexible classrooms, so the school physical environment. This goes to, um, it speaks a little bit on those images that we just presented where the space looks different. The students maybe have an option of where to learn. It might not be at their desk or at their table. It might be a designated area in the room. Um, this also includes shifted teacher roles, um, shifted student teacher roles, which I see that the bullet is missing, but it is um, it is part of what, what flexible learning includes. And this just means that teachers become culturally competent facilitators of learning, and the students have a greater choice and ownership over their learning and their work. So making sure that teachers have that culturally responsive knowledge and skill set in order to identify what their students need uh, to empower their learners. It also includes blended learning. And blended learning means um, using technology as a tool, as a tool, and I will say that again, as a tool to enhance um, um, approach, I'm sorry, to, oh, to provide each student with a more personalized experience. So um, not only providing them with this personalized experience, but also developing their online um, digital skills. It also gives students the opportunity to control their time, place, path, and pace of learning. And lastly, it includes flexible grouping. So the idea of students being placed in multiple group configurations in response to their needs. So how are we how are we making sure that students are working collaboratively and um, working together to complete a task? So groupings can include the whole class. It can include small groups, centers, partners, tutoring, and even individual time for blended and other personalized activities. And I feel like this is really an important area because it's where your students really get this. Um, social and emotional development, so it's a place where um, students can really learn how to problem solve in the classroom. Um, so in deepening our understanding of what 
anytime, anywhere in flexible learning environments look like. Um, we also want to address that flexible design needs to extend to time as well. 21st century learning cannot fully flower um, with this kind of rigid calendar, rigid um, schedule. We need to think about how to make our schedules more flexible because we know that sometimes project-based work and interdisciplinary um, work um, requires more than 50 to 60 minute blocks. Many schools are turning to block scheduling to create a bigger, more adjustable time slot for student learning and for teaching, teaching planning and professional development. So with that being said, we're now going to welcome uh, Diana, who will speak a little bit more on flexible school schedules and what that looks like. Hi, everyone. Um, so you actually have a handout that's uh, linked from your webinar today that includes a few different resources, including the one that you see on your screen. Um, so if you like this, you can definitely look a little bit more into it. Um, but where I was starting with this tool was um, time after time when I work um, and my team works coaching schools, particularly those in traditional districts, um, they again and again hit upon what they see as, as barriers to really becoming more flexible learning environments. And one of those barriers is there's way too many ideas and options and possibilities out there but none of them feel really attainable. So what I sought to do here was to give people a starting place. Um, this is not by any means the definitive list of all ways that a school can set up their schedule. Rather, I saw this as a starting point for conversations, for school-based design teams, for teacher leaders, um, for principals, for communities, to start thinking about what design for their school could give them an opening to include more flexible learning experiences for their students. So you'll see that this is set up in a bit of a continuum. Those on the left allow for retaining more of the rigid and centralized control structures that schools traditionally have. Some of these are, are good starting places. Those on the right are the least rigid. They have the most distributed control. Um, these are the boldest but maybe also sometimes the most intimidating or challenging ones to bring to life. Um, type A, as you see on this chart, um, this looks a little bit like a traditional high school. There's fewer blocks maybe than the, the seven block day or eight block day that some high schools have, but it still looks traditional. You've got your four core classes. You've got room for some elective courses or an elective course. Um, and some of those traditional schools are still finding opportunities to provide a certain segment of their day for flexible time. And this flex time could be a chance for students to have some agency within their school day. Um, they might be able to go to a, a free forum advisory program where they can dig deeper into some passion projects, where they can connect with teachers um, related to courses that they're struggling, where they can get extra online tutorials. Um, where they can collaborate with classmates um, to meet different students' needs in different ways. So um, in the box in the bottom right, you can see more descriptions of how to use that flex time. But even in a very traditional day, you can make a block of time available to students where these options are there. Um, as you get more bold, you move into type B, where a larger portion of the student's day is that flex time. They still have the ability to do some or all of their courses in more traditional ways and shortened classes to get some of those core uh, learnings out of the way, hit the common core standards, or some of the things that are tougher to hit in more um, bold and flexible groupings. But then they have a good chunk of their day that is really flexible to the different students' needs. They might sit at computers for some of this time. They may be sitting around a table collaborating with their peers on big projects. They might be leaving school. Um, so that time can look a lot of different ways, but in this model, a lot of times you'll see that half of the student day um, or half of the day, several days a week, is devoted to this. Um, the third type, um, those who are familiar with the linked learning model might 
kind of recognize this. It's the idea that within any given school or within any given district, there's different themed academies that begin to offer some flexible pathways for students. Um, and a good chunk of their day would be devoted to their core, the traditional core subjects, but they would be built around some of these themes to capture the student's interest. Um, and then there may be a little bit of time where they'd be devoted to career-based um, work related to that theme. So maybe a school would have a health sciences academy and a, and a humanities academy or a social justice academy and a STEM academy. Um, those would provide entry points for students to find something they're interested in, and they'd fold a lot of their core learning around those themes, um, and then have some time to really do internships or hands-on learning related to those themes and those potential career paths. Um, you'll see this a lot at the secondary level. Um, type D is when schools want to have most days or some days of the week or sometimes many weeks of the year looking a little bit more traditional where they'll have their core content areas and a few electives but then they provide opportunities scattered throughout the week or throughout the year where that routine is broken and students have the chance to do some more uh, open possibilities for their learning and their chance to dive into things in a different way. Um, so that's type D. Type E, if people are familiar with the big picture learning model, this is pretty similar. Students spend all day, uh, and this, this is frankly what a lot of elementary schools look like, um, they spend all day with the same teacher. Um, at the secondary level, it might be termed advisory. Um, and each student gets uh, some flexible opportunities presented to them, but in the context of a traditional school day, the, the difference is there may be one or more teachers coming in and out to this very flexible space. Um, I think there was still, um, in the difference between E and F, there's still a traditional beginning and end to the day with type E. With type F, this last one on the list, um, you're looking at a school model where there is no traditional start or end to the school day. There may be a building that is open for certain hours where students may be scheduled for one or more classes based on their needs, their interests, the competencies they still have to meet, um, but they may also be off campus engaging in internships or projects or, or participatory action research. Or they may be at home or at a cafe or in a special room in the school where they're engaged with online learning or collaborating with peers. Um, in these days, you might have a, a situation where different kids pick a schedule that works for them. Some kids go seven to three, some kids go in afternoons and evenings. Or you might have a situation where depending on the day and depending on the semester, Courses are scheduled at different times to meet different needs um, that might look a little bit more like a college might look, where there's courses offered at different points and advisors and counselors work with students to map out a plan to allow them to meet all their requirements in a way that meets their interests. All that to say that this provides, um, this tool provides fodder for conversation and I've found that when Schools have a starting place for starting the conversation. It can help them to focus the discussion with the, the staff at the school around what needs does the community want to meet by looking at enhancing the flexibility. What rigid structures need to stay because of outside constraints in the school or the district or the community being served. And which ones are just there for traditional reasons that the school could look at breaking in order to meet the different students' needs in, in new ways and to provide more agency to the students themselves. Um, so I definitely advise you to, to use this tool as you're starting those conversations and, uh, and really see where that conversation takes the school because I think it's very intimidating to think that you have to be completely flexible to all students' needs, but it's also, I think, too rich of an opportunity not to consider finding a way that works with your school. And I will turn it back to Carla. Yes, 
Great. Thank you, Diana, for that wonderful um, explanation and presentation on what a flexible school schedule could look, um, could look like. I think it's important to note that this is secondary school, and so flexible learning is going to look different um, from elementary to middle school to high school. Um, so this is obviously ideal for um, a high school, and I think you brought up a good example of a big picture learning school where students really do reflect that flexible learning, and they have the opportunity to leave their schools twice a week for an internship, which is counted um, towards their their academic credit. Um, so we we definitely want to bring you back uh, to thinking about equity and flexible learning and what that looks like um, in the classroom also what that what that might not look like in the classroom and so after some discussion with some colleagues uh, we were thinking about well what happens when um, flexible uh, when somebody tries to do flexible learning in the classroom but they don't do it successfully with an um, equity focused lens and so we came up with five things to consider in order to implement a successful flexible learning environment um, and I think this is important to think to think deeply about because um, it impacts our learners and sometimes as practitioners in the classroom we might make decisions where we um, we might not be conscious of, of exactly um, how those decisions might impact or negatively impact our students so um, the first point that that was brought up is the idea of internships and internship opportunities and so we want to make sure that we stress the importance of if we are offering our students internships that we are also helping them find those internships and we're not putting that um, that responsibility um, on our students so not only are we helping them look for those internships, but we're really creating a structured framework and system to support our students when they do go out in the field. Um, and, and also when they're developing their work um, that they're going to bring back into the classroom and, um, and um, present their experiences. So thinking about what that access looks like to those different opportunities and there might be some legwork here so there might be um it might look like your school having a designated um person there that um consistently looking for those opportunities and it, it definitely involves um knowing the community and getting involved with the community the second point is access to te technology outside of school. So if we're using technology in the school, that is absolutely great. It allows students um, their, the opportunity to really strengthen their, their digital skills, to really navigate um, with, with, on a computer and on different sites. Uh, but if we're thinking about assigning work outside of the school, then we definitely need to ask questions like, do you have access to a computer? Um, and if you don't, you have access to a library. Or how else can you um, um, reach a computer? Or if not, what are other options in order for you to get that work done? Um, not everybody, of course, and I'm th I think that we're all aware of this, has technology at home or, or is able to um, afford uh, equipment like that. I think the third, so the third point is really scheduling that adapts to the student's needs. And when in our discussion, what we were thinking about is, is how some students might carry the responsibility of being um, the provider in their family or the caretaker in their family. So being able to acknowledge um, these circumstances at home that really do impact their their school um, life and also their academic um, growth in the classroom. And 
one I think one thing to point out as as I'm I'm speaking and I'm noticing what where what what these points what what the common thread is is that these are all identities of our students and so I think that if in the beginning we start to think about well how how do we how much do we really know our students and how much do their identities play a role in our um, in our classroom community um, as mentioned before I think this really navigates what decisions are really made in the classroom in order to not only make flexible learning environments successful but just personalized learning in general. Uh, the fourth point is that the classroom really needs to adapt to the students' physical needs um, based on how they learn. Um, so, for example, if a student needs to stand up um, while they're learning, then that needs to be an option. If they need to read in a quiet corner, that could be an option. If they rather read maybe even outside in, in you know, the hallway, that could be an option. I do remember uh, being a teacher and having some, some fourth graders that were not able to sit in their seat for a very long time and so would definitely be moving their bodies constantly. And they already knew that they had the option to stand up whenever they needed to. And so it wasn't about um, asking me, like, uh, can I please stand up? It was like they knew that they had that option. And so my goal was not only to to provide them with, with um, what they needed in order to learn, but also to empower them to make that choice on their own. So the last one is, and I think it's a really important one, it's, it's some, something that I think we, um, we overlook at times, is having a culturally relevant environment. Not only an environment, also a con content. So for example, when, when we mentioned uh, flexible learning, and one way of doing it is by having a blended learning classroom. So when I was coaching with, with teachers one-on-one -on -one and we were thinking about different online tools to use, for example, um, videos or um, Socrative for assessment or Kahoot or other forms of assessment, um, I've always encouraged teachers to remember to be culturally sensitive um, and responsive to to the way they formulated their assessments and also to the content that they used in in their um, in their curriculum. And so flexible learning will not be successful unless we're building these spaces that students can relate to, that stu students see themselves reflected, but not only themselves, they also see um, uh, windows, they have opportunities to see what the outside world also reflects. And so being conscious about what we're putting, um, placing on our walls, um, what we're, again, what we're using um, in, our lesson, in our lessons, what the content is. And so I think that that is one area that, that definitely promotes um, a healthy learning environment and um, can, be really, can be really helpful to, 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 to helping students achieve. Um, so, with that being said, that is the end of the webinar, and I think, oh, yep, no, well, not the end, it is the, the question portion of, of the web, webinar. So, I will open up the, the floor, so to speak, for some questions, and um, we'll read them out loud, and Diana and I are here to, to answer them. Give me just one second. All right, so we have one question here. Um, somebody asked, do we have examples, um, I think this is related to the tool that I shared, of how students are supervised in models D, E, and F in their pathway experience? For example, how is the teacher of record determined? Who determines if the student has met the standard or graduation requirement? So yeah, there's a, there's a host of answers to this. Um, I, I would say right now, Model S probably is found much more frequently in independent or charter schools. Um, that is a little trickier to pull off in a traditional um, system, especially when there's demands at seat time and 
certain standards and high stakes tests that need to be met. But I have seen uh, E, uh, I guess if we're going to go um, back to that model, the, the one where you have sort of set hours of school day, students spend that whole day kind of in advisory, so to speak, uh, occur. I mentioned big picture learning schools. There's several of those that are public schools. Um, one example is their flagship school, the Met in in Providence, um, <laughs> um, Carla's son goes to actually, um, and uh, students there, you know, they have their teacher of record, that advisor they call them, who they're with throughout the day, um, and they're pulled into separate courses for things like math, if there's a, you know, a, a content area that's a little tougher to fulfill through projects and through internships. But really, workplace learning is at the center of what they do, and project-based learning is at the center of what they do, and students' days all really vary. Now, this is, again, at the high school level, so there is more flexibility in allowing students to leave campus. Um, D, the, uh, the, the one where you see students having certain days of the year or of the week in which they are off-site or engaged in flexible learning. This is a lot more common. Um, a lot of expeditionary learning schools have this model. Um, I'm thinking of, let's say, Casco Bay High School in Portland, Maine, where I visited a few weeks ago. Um, every so often, the school sort of drops everything and gives students the opportunity to do capstone projects or, or expedition capstones. Um, and, you know, in this situation, it may be that they are with different teachers and they are with in their traditional classes, but they're still teachers that are are on hand to supervise, plan, and, and to some extent, with the help of the students, lead the course. Um, and in other cases, these are, you know, very much student-driven where the school is, is open and the students are in and out um, to, to go to their internships, um, but the, you know, there is some permission um, that you have to get from the parents um, if this is with high school students. Now, let's say you're working with younger kids. I know that this tool largely was focused on secondary school. Um, if you're working with younger kids, you're probably going to see this being much more captured within the school as still the home base and any sort of expeditions happening are probably being led by, by the teacher or, or by sometimes parents and trusted community members with, you know, thoroughly vetted uh, opportunities available and permission slips. Um, that's not to say that elementary schools can't be flexible. I think in elementary schools, you're probably less likely to be looking at flexibility in terms of the duration of the school day or the hours, and you're more likely to start thinking about how to use technology as an important tool, how to vary the, the setup of your classroom, and some of the other things Carla was discussing. Thank you. Um, so another question is, is there a current example of flexible of a flexible learning environment? Um, the answer is yes. There's lots. So, <laughs> so there's lots um, that we've seen um, in our coaching. So I would say uh, in Boston, Holmes Elementary School is do is really focused on pushing um, flexible learning environments, and they started off. And so the principal is um, leading leading this culture in in her school, and really hoping to get um, all her classrooms um, to to a flexible learning space. Uh, I I definitely think that funding is part of it, and she has some funding, and so she's able to do that. In Rhode Island, I would say if you visit any Met school, again, um, not to continue to um, put big picture learning on the spot like that, but they really do reflect a flexible learning environment. They do not use desks. Uh, they use one table, and they have several tables in their hallways, and so all students sit um, together and learn together and work collaboratively when they're in, in, in school. Yeah, I would just also add um, another kind of school model, you see this a lot again, is, is expeditionary learning schools. But I, was, I think, you know, Portland, Maine is a really good example here because you've got this very outside the box expeditionary learning school with a small student body. Um, but they're more traditional public high schools. 
still have found ways to weave in mm -hmm. flexible scheduling. Um, during high school, uh, for example, one of their two more traditional high schools, they have now incorporated a flex block every day that students have access to. Um, so that would be more like the uh, A model on that um, thing I, I shared with you. And at the elementary school level and middle school level, the way that they've incorporated flexibility is to provide different schools with different schedules and structures so families can actually select and, and be placed in schools that meet the needs of their family and, and the child, um, him or herself. Um, so you can also kind of reconceive how districts can become opportunities for flexibility by providing a variety of possibilities. Now, that does open up other concerns in terms of equity, you know, how do you ensure equitable access um, to make sure that students from all parts of the city can, or the region in some cases, can have access to the learning opportunity that best works for that child, but that still does kind of allow a district to think of more ways to be flexible. Um, I'd say there's a lot of really great examples in Texas and Wisconsin as well uh, of really good schedules for flexibility. I'd look up flexible modular scheduling as one starting point for the really outside the box options. Um, and so we have one more question. I think this is for you, Diana. Uh, what criteria what criteria would you recommend to help determine which type of flexible schedule that, that was on your diagram um, is best for a particular school? Um, yeah, so I would say you have to start with community input. Um, you have to see what need, whose needs aren't being met by the traditional system. Um, and sometimes people are aware that their needs aren't being met and sometimes they're not. But I think, you know, you have to start by finding ways to engage those who might be marginalized by the current system. Um, so this is where the family and community engagement becomes crucial. And it might involve looking at some data, doing some surveys, finding out, you know, what barriers are there to to students being more successful, to families being more involved in the school community. Um, and sometimes it's a good idea to have a kind of a task force who's guiding this process, but I think you really need to make it widely accessible and have wide outreach, multiple languages, multiple times for meetings. You can't always have evening meetings. You can't always have morning meetings. You have to find different times where different folks can access it. Um, and sometimes have ways where folks can, can get involved um, outside of being physically present, because that's not always an option. Um, so that's the starting point. And then I think the next thing you have to look at is, um, is look at what's working and do a lot of site visits. Um, I think some of the most exciting and innovative things that happen in the schools we coach happen after their interest has been sparked by what's working somewhere else. And you know, every region around the country has a few schools, if not more, that are that are really standout personalized learning schools. The important consideration here is that one of the things we're really thinking about is schools that are not just being flexible, but being flexible with a real eye on equity. So I think there's sort of a two-phase process. First, you have to see what your community needs with a real eye on where there are inequitable outcomes happening. And then you start looking at the flexible structures that will enable it. Flexibility for flexibility's sake isn't going to solve all of your problems. I think you really need to think about flexibility as a way to enhance the learning experience for those who right now are being underserved. Thank you. Um, I can only say that I second what everything you said, especially thinking about um, the starting point being what's working and um, what are the needs, what are the needs of the community. So. That really wraps up our webinar for um, and for the day, and that was the last session of our series, and we cannot thank everybody more. Um, so again, thank you for giving your time, your participation, and your support in our series. We are are very grateful, and we welcome. Uh, for, we welcome any questions that you might have that you were not um, were not answered, or if you'd like to contact us to to speak with us about certain certain um, pieces of of our series or certain points. Uh, and our email last slide.
So, and you can also um, find our emails on the CCE website. So again, thank you and have a wonderful evening. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.